The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Look at all these beautiful, cool kids in the room today. Uh, welcome to the Stoa, everyone. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. And today we have Ellie Hain and Tarn Rogers Johns, uh, two insiders in the sense making scene uh, who have seen the good, bad, and ugly. Uh, in this session, they will be uh, talking about some of the problems they've seen and also uh, presenting fresh new ideas. So how today is going to work, it's a 60 minute session. Um, Ellie and Tarn are going to uh, speak for about 30 minutes, uh, share their thoughts, uh, and then we're going to pivot to Q&A. If you have any questions, throw your question in the chat box. I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question. Um, if you want me to read on your behalf, this will go on YouTube. I just indicate that. Uh, and that being said, I will take Tarn and Ellie in. Boom. You're up. Yeah. Boom, we're in. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, thanks, Peter, for inviting, for hosting. We're very happy to be here. So, yeah, should we do a short intro? A short intro, yeah. Should we start sharing the screen, maybe? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, no, but we need to start from the beginning. Oops. Yeah. One moment. Sorry, everyone. Okay. All right. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. How, I don't know how to start. Technical difficulty. Anyway, I'll, we'll just start with the intro. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my name's Tan, as Peter said, and uh, I, um, until recently, I was working as editor of Emerge, which some of you might be familiar with through the Emerge podcast, which is kind of loosely associated with us. And uh, yeah, and that's what I've been doing. And I think my entrance into this into this world was kind of atypical in that I had didn't really know anything about it until I had was paid to learn about it um, and uh, yeah which is definitely atypical in that I think mm -hmm. a lot of people come into this scene because they're working in jobs where they're being paid to do something that they doesn't inspire them um, so I had a real quick learning uh, curve when I first started working at Emerge um, and previously to that I think I, I, I came from this background that was quite um, typical of someone in my generation it was quite postmodern. Um, was very concerned with being woke and kind of, and then when I arrived in the scene, I um, I kind of, that was all deconstructed. Um, and I, so I think I went on a journey that was quite similar to what we need people to go on, or we need a, a group of people to go on in order to kind of make the change that we want to see in the world um, kind of real. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, my journey, towards metamodernism and game B was quite different, but probably more similar to most of the people here. So I, I was actually a law student and was like fully in the game A hustle. Um, and then I discovered I was really miserable. So I just kind of like fell down the internet rabbit hole. Um, the Twitter ready podcasts um, and got sucked into it. And I think I had an experience that many people can relate to. That essentially is at, the fir at first you're just so fascinated because you find these people that look at the world through the similar lenses that you had, but um, more meta. And they're seeing the same problems that you do and they feel similar than, than you do. Um, and this generates a lot of initial excitement. And then when you find a sense of community, when you realize that this is just like not only a few people do it. <laughs> That's coming. <laughs> um, I think uh, like a scene that's uh, getting together. But then I, I also started working um, at Emerge. That's how Tarn and I met in Berlin, where we are right now. 
Um, but then during this journey, I also saw some of the problems and I got some, some of the disillusionment that I see that people are also bringing up. Yeah. And that's what we want to talk about today. But it's very important to say that we, we want to address these from the sense that we are in the same team. Like even though we're criticizing, the only reason why we're criticizing is because we want to see this movement, if we can call it this way, reach um, oh, its maximum know. potential. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everything coming from a place of love, but we still need to talk, <laughs> it's important. Yeah. So yeah, okay. Um, what did we do for this presentation, Tarn? Um, what yeah. happened? We had a problem. Yeah, so we actually spent quite a lot of time um, I mean, so coming back to um, to who we are, I when I first met Ellie, it was the first time I'd really had the opportunity to bounce. You know, I came from this kind of um, this background of, of of feminist theory. That was really my my thing when I was at uni. I was very from a very feminist perspective, and then I arrived in the scene, which was kind of really critiquing the, um, the the culture, the kind of culture wars, and I could see how needed that was, but I wasn't able to kind of marry these two perspectives until I met Ellie. And it was the first time I'd ever really been able to say, okay, uh, you know, I get that what's going on in feminism is, is problematic right now, but also does that mean that the only people that we listen to now are, are, are men again? Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of this, um, it was the first time I'd ever really been able to bounce ideas off someone and, and have them reflected back at me. And I think because we come from a similar subculture yeah exactly yeah we were able to bond in in this seeing someone that looks like you and not just for representation issues like that's not the main um, problem that we're trying to address but feeling that you're seen in your experience and that you're able to to talk with someone that like really understands where you're coming from especially not just being a woman but being young and in this case like also european uh, from a movement that tends to be like quite u.s centric um yeah we also wanted to say at the beginning we can like skip this part but oh yeah 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 that what happened is that we had this like presentation uh, done at the beginning and then we realized that we were falling into the same problem that we were trying to criticize essentially that we want to bring up some problems um but that a lot of people are already acknowledging and we were not bringing like something truly fresh. So then we just decided to go a bit on a different way. And that's why we decided to do the memes um, for this presentation, because I feel like they are very good new ways of communicating um, some of the problems that we want to tackle in the end. And why memes? Oh, hi memes, because they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, um, and we need more humor, totally. Like that's, that's for one, but also because I feel that memes are truly the new form of communication of the 21st century, they are so powerful. They have so much cultural information ingrained in it. And because they have this like visual aid, but also with text, you have the, an emotional reaction that you just see with the, with the person. And this is what creates the connection to the embodied part of the conversation that we sometimes miss or, or say that's lacking. When you see, you know, you see like, Pablo Escobar, like he, he's like feeling like really sad. And that's essentially like how I felt this morning. Like, wow, I need all this conversation. <laughs> I need like all this script and it's, I feel like it's worthless. Or saying when you feel like Woody here and you have Woody, right? Like, how you, buzz like, buzz, buzz like, buzz. buzz like, yeah. yeah. And this is like the sense making people trying to like map for us all these new pathways to the new planetary civilization. And everything sounds so amazing. It's so poetic. And of course, like I'm drawn to it. Like that's why. I, I fell into it in the first place, but then at the same time, we're just like Woody. <laughs> like we're young, we still need to make money. Yeah. Um, how how do we survive? Um, it doesn't. It it it. it uh, Richard Bartlett said in a stoic conversation recently. It kind of it's like it can be intellectual junk food. Like it, it feels it feels really good, and you're like, wow, that's it. And then when you leave, you're kind of like, oh, okay. What do I what do I do now? But yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially, and that's something that we see brought up. Tom, you were saying that when you were editor, you would get quite often emails from young people saying that- What is this? You know, I want to be part of this. Um, and many times, Ellie and I have had the experience of being in groups of friends where we start talking and everyone's just quiet because they're like, this is so interesting. This is so different. And I need, I, I'm, this, people are so hungry for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have several friends that have, you know, kind of attempted to, 
to kind of you know intelligent tend, intelligent yeah. people who engage try and engage and then they're like yeah I don't I don't really you know they can't follow mm -hmm. and also this sense of we're mapping out how the world ideally would look like if we're lucky in say like 30 years but we're still in today we're still like in the system the gaming system or however you want to call it and what is the next step and for me that was something that as someone who got into these um thinking from when I was quite young like 20 or 21 and I still had my whole career ahead of me I was like wow so what am I supposed to do like do I need to play along and that generated a, a lot of anxiety for me this way but um yeah yeah and then we're we're just going to quickly go through the problems but then talk about the solutions we just have them yeah. down here oopsie then yeah there's the fact that these conversations seem to be a lot of one-way conversations between the heroes the sense maker the chief um yeah sense makers and then everyone else that we were so eagerly um following them and created this kind of like personality cult which is fine like i, I get it because they do have very insightful things to say but if we're talking sense making and sense making is something that we're doing collectively and every person is kind of a sensor um, that has some noise and some signal in, in 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 the jargon we need as many sensors as we can in order to have the best sense making possible in order to like have the most complete picture of reality but then again what was Sam was saying <laughs> we felt into this thing we felt that we perhaps transcended postmodernism but where were the women where are the different people yeah. and it's not just about women yeah it's not it's not coming at it from this perspective of um, identity politics um, it's different ways of thinking different ways of uh, constructing meaning different ways of talking and even interacting and um, we are we're aware mm -hmm. that we we talk in a very different way than people sometimes come on this podcast um, and it's just about being able to then arrive in these conversations and, and, and kind of find the, the symbiosis, find the space in between mm -hmm. uh, in order to come up with the kind of solutions that we need to fix the problems that we're all facing. Exactly. And different ways of showing up. It's not just enough to have, you know, the very diverse picture, but just do you come up with like your vulnerability? Do you come up with humor? Do you come with, you know, a more like less intellectual way of speaking, but that's still very embodied and resonating with a lot of people, like which essentially we all have a framework that we've constructed and that we feel is very powerful, which are all the different ways, all the different tools that we can make sure this framework, this worldview gets to the most people as possible. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So that's one that's, part. Yeah, I think that's. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next one. No, you didn't move. Yeah. Okay. Then a big part of culture. <laughs> culture change. I mean, what do we mean when we talk about culture change? Um, well, Ellie was bringing it up with the with the memes, with the memes, and this is why we decided to kind of meme this entire conversation because, as this meme says, we could speak about this for like ten minutes and probably give you the same intellectual understanding of what we're saying as just looking at this meme gives you exactly um and this is why we need to kind of find these ways of communicating these ideas out that are yeah in essence this meme i feel it represents what the whole conversation could be like is culture change or is it just like an hour-long podcast conversation um it's very important to have the theory and to have the sense making in a way that's what kind of like furnishes your brain I feel, but we need to distinguish between the kind of knowledge that is, um, let's say, classificatory versus the kind of knowledge that is generative, that really creates uh, culture kind change. of change, culture change. And I feel like there is, was um, a lot of resistance towards making things popular, making things mainstream. And I get that, yeah, sometimes when a product that's very pure, which is the mainstream, it can get corrupted. But we need to find the ways of playing with the system in order to reach um, all the people that we want to reach and to make this a truly uh, global movement. You were saying this thing about climate change before when we were talking? Um, yes. Um, I was saying that 
I get the sense, I mean, we live in this kind of really, we live in a, a culture where there's a lot of fragmented movements. Um, and when last year, when uh, the kind of Extinction Rebellion stuff kicked off, there was this kind of sense of, oh, finally, there's a kind of global movement that we can all get behind. Um, and this is, this has the same potential. I mean, obviously, things have evolved since that um, original kind of fervor behind um, Extinction Rebellion, but I think uh, this this has the potential to have the same kind of uniting, uh, yeah, uniting potential. Mm -hmm. And in a time where it's like, where the time right now feels extremely ripe for these kinds of ideas, we're saying before that when Corona came, despite yeah. it is objectively quite bad and our lifestyle gets definitely negatively impacted, it also felt like a kind of of relief it was, yeah it was a really it was an opportunity opening up of um I, I observed in especially in this in 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 this culture in this scene um a lot of excitement because it kind of felt like we've been talking about a systemic breakdown and, mm -hmm. and um, collapse for a while and it was finally like other people were starting to kind of feel it as well and it was kind of permeating our our daily our daily lives um and so yeah the overton window is open and it's and it's time it, it's a good time to really be thinking about how to spread these ideas mm -hmm. further. Exactly, and it felt like it became more obvious that all the previous pathways that had been tried and tested were not working anymore. So it was a time where people, it's a time where it feels that everyone collectively is like way more open to being truly radical and brave and experimental in how we're bringing about change. Um, so yeah that's how we should approach also the issue of um, culture change. I hear I make, yeah, a bit of the differentiation between the system builders. So those are like the people who are actually building, say the economic, educational, um, political systems that we're ingrained in versus the culture changes. These are the people that create the imaginary culture in general. And these um, is more in the artistic creative domain and how do we collaborate um, between these people and of course there's a part like essays are very important these are part of theory but which new ways of bringing this like theory down to the masses can we yeah. um right yeah but this is very hard if all your theory and all of our message is just completely wrapped in jargon <laughs> <laughs> in group jargon yeah um yeah, we had a, we've had an interesting experience with this the past weeks because we're scripting a podcast uh, series, and so what we're trying to do is take the theory that we that we've that we know we've come across and um, bring it down to you know literally this physical act of kind of bringing it down to real world real world examples, real um, real cultural examples, um, and then we would get like wrapped into these like mind spins because we were like, mm -hmm. is, is that like is that what it is? I don't I, like yeah. and it was it's this kind of it, you really realize through the process of trying to make something tangible how much is how much is implicit um, mm -hmm. in a lot of uh, very conceptual um, thinking and sometimes how little you actually know sometimes it felt or you may know but you need to like really bring it out sometimes it felt like trying to pin down a dream when you use jargon where you use like these like highly complex phrases it's just like oh yeah and of course it resonates it's beautiful right but then when you're trying to like pin it down to essentially like what it means it's like trying to remember a dream that you like dreamt last night it's so hard mm -hmm. and so that's why even though sometimes jargon makes us sound extremely smart <laughs> um the smartest way or like how we actually sound smarter is when we're just being crisp and clear in what you want, what we want to do, and especially if we're talking about, um, yeah, creating change yeah. from the ground up. But we were seeing that when we were doing business proposals, that it was so easy to get caught up in just the rhetoric, but it was really hard to actually say what we wanted to do. Well, jargon serves purpose because it can, it is bringing, um, it is kind of naming things that maybe don't already exist in, yeah. and, and kind of giving them. Uh, making them embodied mm -hmm. or creating a new concept for them like a new idea that yeah, yeah. and also it can be an in-group identifier so you know who vibes with you <laughs> who's exactly. reading the same things as you who's listening to the same podcast and in a, in a really really complex world um 
it's it's even more important because we live in this such scattered information ecology where you know it's you, you kind of you, it's kind of instinctive to want to know who your tribe is um yet you know it's not it's not necessarily going to do the purpose of a kind of wide scale culture change that mm -hmm. we're talking about um, yeah, we've and that, ten minutes. So. Oh, we've got ten minutes. Okay. All right. So this is just yeah another illustration of of like how you can speak in jargon. Yeah, and, and yeah. It, it's, mm -hmm. it will yeah. Okay. So yeah, enough. We've done enough. Go back. Things. I want to read this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is a, a description of the. This um, is a description of the session. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, exactly. It's important that jargon, yeah, serves this like community purpose that is not completely um, disposable. Well, yeah, we had a lot of fun way. writing this because it was actually fun writing in the jargon, and we mm -hmm. understood it all. So we were kind of like, we were like, yeah, and then we were like, no, no, we're, this is this is supposed to be funny because <laughs> 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 we were kind of also kind of into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if, if I was to say like something really good that this thing has created in the first place is that it has created a sense of community of a lot of people that felt alone before they did really like who are the people that see the world in, through the same lenses as we do and I felt like that that's what I was drawn to in the first place and just having this feeling that you're not alone that there's more people like you they're not the only weirdo out there um it's extremely positive and then I can understand how these reinforces the use of jargon because it's this like signifier like cultural signifier that we belong we're in the same tribe um but ultimately it comes back to it's about the same conditions it's exactly it just creates the same conditions so yeah we just wanted to analyze the two sides um, um next one. okay but enough sense making and criticizing then we will just fall into the same trap where we're so good at analyzing but not that good at solution creation and we're running out of time not just like in the session, but also like in broader context scale, like we are running out of time guys for, so we need to think of solutions. We are in the solutions department. Um, this we, is, this could be, I mean, we had a brief conversation with Peter before. This is, this is a much bigger conversation than what we're able to cover in this, mm -hmm. in this session. Um, and we have a lot of ideas, um, but this is just kind of a taster. Yeah. yeah and we're going to focus on the solutions regarding the communication and broader, ex yeah, communication of, of the sense making scene and how do we make these like penetrate the mainstream because that's where we focused in. We are communicators and yeah, we we're working at Emerge, that's how we met. But we recognize that this is only part of the solution. We also meet a lot of people, like people on the ground, system builders that are actually um, building the real systems that will make the world that we want to live with happen. But in regards to communications, as we're saying, um, memes, 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 going back to the same thing. We decided to do this presentation um, with memes in a way to illustrate the point that a lot of the things that we say can just be um, explained in like a very short image. But the power of memes is not just that. Like if we, if we analyze the current culture war that we're at, um, the polarization, the political polarization, this war was not fought with theory, it was fought with memes, and especially like how the alt-right gained so much dominance. It gained dominance through like these extremely transgressive, extremely provocative um, memes that started in, in forums like 8chan, 4chan, and then spread like widely. And what these culture always made fun of was that the left couldn't meme. Mm -hmm. And then I say, if the left can't mean, like, we don't even try, like, not only we don't try, but we just think that it's, or at least what I've seen from in, in the scene is like, it's the normies that like need to get out to us, like they need to like step up their complexity. It's, it's an opinion I've come across uh, a lot is that people don't, people shouldn't read what they want to read, they need to read this, and they, this is usually like a 4,000 4, word essay. Um, and I find it has been very difficult to communicate that people that that's just it doesn't work like that <laughs> yeah and then in the end even though if that's the ideal solution we need to be aware that we don't 
we're not in a terrain where we can like choose the ideal and we need to play with culture. And if that means being a bit less pure, but it works in regards to the impact, then we need to recognize that. At some point, like we need to have some metrics and we need to see like, yeah, is it, are we only in the business of like being pure and like making the most sophisticated theory? And we might be, but then we need to recognize that and at least like not put in our shoulders a metal of like, oh no, here we're the new system changers. Yeah. Um, and yeah. How the how do like the meta modern people mean? That would be like super interesting. Yeah. And then another part um, of culture change is yeah. influencers. Yeah. <laughs> what can no, we say should... about influencers? Um, I mean, even the 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 term influencer even, even within me brings up a lot of judgment. It's, it's like, triggering. It's, it's triggering for it, me too. Yeah, because it's it's um it's people who are kind of playing the system extremely egotistical and, and self-absorbed. Self -absorbed. And that is a lot of influencer culture. And I think this, uh, this meme really sums up uh -huh. um, the different levels that you can think about um, influencers. Yeah, I, I feel like, like a lot of people, even maybe perhaps like the influencers themselves, like hate this term because we have this association of like influencers being the basic bitches and like that's, yeah, the most basic way of thinking about them but then you just realize like the system that they're ingrained in and then there's like influencers as a foot soldiers of like capitalism it's not about them it's just the environment yeah and then, and then recognizing as you say it's that it's a viable it's it's you know it's um i think they did they did a study on teenagers and it used to be that uh, they wanted to be doctors and they want or children they wanted to be firemen and now they say they want to be influencers you know this mm -hmm. is this is kind of seen as a viable career choice for for young people and that is the culture that we're living in exactly. um and so how do we work how, instead of just critiquing this and and, and kind of piling judgment on it how do we work with that system um yeah and not only that it feels so in a way because you know the times that we're living in and like how just extremely bad the economy is for young people speaking firsthand is it feels like the only like viable options that you have is like extreme hustle like there can be extreme hustle in the startup way that's like the more like techie bro way or extreme hustle in the pimp out your personality kind of way and just <laughs> yeah like it, it really is what it is yeah. um and so i can like definitely understand how like toxic this is but if if you read um like for the current situation it really feels you know if, if like all the systems are crumbling well at least i have myself to support if i'm like well enough that i have that yeah. and it's not that i'm not saying that we're like trying to support this culture but the next step would be that influencers in a way that yeah yeah they're just like the archetypal representations of what we value in a system so right now, of course, if the young influencers that we have and like the people that we have, they're the heroes. They are the ones that like represent what we think of as elite in a culture. And of course, there's just like not one um, monoculture. We live in a globalized society, like hyper society that we have a lot of subcultures and the different influencers represent um, the different values that these subcultures have. But how do we play um, with the system? How do we play with the system and not against it and in this way creating these like new representations truly embodied because that's what influencers are like embodied values and um, that society upheld so like how would this representation look like yeah and i think this is something that we've seen a bit of in the metal modern scene with uh -huh. hansi the hansi yeah, finance really. kind of um uh, alter ego mm -hmm. um, and that I think that was kind of an awareness of, of, of the power of, um, of kind of archetypal um, personality exactly. um, and yeah with Hans it's like super intellectual but it could be even something like very subtle but it just transpires um, the values or like the even like sensibilities that we're talking about in a very subtle way but the thing about subtlety and showing something rather than explicitly telling and explicitly telling through theory is because when you get it, then you're just like connecting with through emotion. And that's when it becomes like directly embodied, even though it means that maybe you consciously, rationally are not even aware of what you're um, talking about. So yeah, I think that's, okay. that's it. Yeah, and that's perfect timing. Yeah. Like 5.30. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, just <laughs> exactly. And how do we collaborate, you know, the creatives with the system builders, the theorists, with the hipsters, essentially the people with cultural capital and all this stuff and yeah thank you thank you daddy <laughs> thank you <Keith. laughs> thank, thank you peter 
for the yeah for giving space. us the space uh, to to test these ideas and exactly. interested to hear the Q and A and able to yeah come in with our full selves yeah okay cool um, <laughs> so if uh, if you have any questions start throwing them in the chat I'll call you in a moment. Uh, but like to double click on the kind of the stoic daddy holy slut thing that we were joking up uh, before and re related to I'll, I'll, I'll stop for you uh, yeah stop the screen sharing yeah, yeah there we, go. Uh, we were talking about kind of like vibe like how vibe is different from content um, and you can kind of say the same thing propositionally but you can say it in the like with a different vibe it's going to resonate with people more um, and like for example like the whole game b scene like I can interface with their propositions. I, I, I like them, I learn a lot, but I just don't vibe with that, that, that scene. It's just like, it feels kind of icky, a lot of fanboying, fangirling going on there. Uh, or with like the stoicism movement, there's only like one stoic in the stoic and that's me. And I don't really vibe with the modern stoic movement. It just feels disembodied. And so the stoic has cultivated its own vibe and it, a lot of people are vibing with it, but not everyone's gonna vibe with it, right? So this like this idea that we can have a vibe diversity and that's okay. And I think that's that's what you're you're gesturing at. So I was wondering if you can maybe speak on this like mono vibing that's occurring in the scene versus like a cultivating a vibe diversity. Yeah, I really like looking at it through like a the permaculture principle of diversity and and how and if you have a monoculture of thought, if you have a monoculture of, of people, it's you get the sense of safety and community, but you're not going to get the soil, the rich soil that you need to to grow rich solutions. Uh, and I think if you have a kind of strong eco, different ecosystem of thought, then you will then you will create richer soil um, and different vibes. And I like that system of vibes. Yeah, yeah, vibe diversity is great. And I think the, the the problem with this and the reason why it's 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 difficult is that it it creates conflict, um, and it means that you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable in a way that maybe you you know because we talk about being comfortable with being uncomfortable a lot in in this scene but in a different way in a, in a different way that you can't anticipate yet and it, it's just it's it's a lot more difficult to to have a diversity of vibes and still you know disarm your judgment and disarm your your superiority complex and your ego yeah yeah the um yeah, do you have any anything about on that ali well, yeah, especially the fact that different vibes will resonate with different people and that a vibe, um, how to say it, um, each vibe like serves a different kind of purpose. And there's no like better vibes and like bad vibes. In here, like the analogy that comes to my head is when people used to criticize um, techno, like techn techno music. Um, electronic music saying that oh this is not good music this is just sound and then like this DJ the answer that he he came up with was like the people that criticize it they don't understand the context in which is meant to be enjoyed and so I think that this mm. yeah mm. it's because yeah of course like you're not supposed to like listen to techno like shitty headphones and like in your room when you're trying to relax as you would with like classical music um, or like normal speaker and I think that that is the same with vibes like each vibe works in a certain context and like serves a specific purpose. And it's not about like which vibe is better, better and like which vibe is not better, is that we need to make space. And that's what I refer to like metamodernism in the sense making as being a framework. Mm -hmm. And that framework, like the purpose that it should serve is to open up for all these different kinds of vibe. It's just kind of like the OS that you have embodied. Mm -hmm. And then you come up as your authentic self with it. But it's just, it's not a way of, it's not a personality, right? Mm -hmm. And we've kind of associated um, the sense making scene with a type of personality, but that's just because the first people that came there like had this. And also because then this creates a human attractor that it feels that you can only be part of this if you have this personality. But that just, it's completely bullshit. Like it's just not true. And that's not the way that it can work the best. Mm -hmm. The way that it can work the best. If this is just the OS, you have it within you. That's like the feel that you have. And then you create your, you just show up as your authentic self with the vibe that you resonate most, and then you find the others and you pollinate in that way. So. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, and what's coming to mind is, is what we were talking about before we let people in about embodiment and then that, that session high pitch with Bonita, Nora, uh, Rhea. Um, 
and how when I was there, I just felt embodied listening to them. There were like six ladies talking and that was it. And I just felt so embodied. But I also, the content was rich as well. And then, uh, so there's like an embodiment vibe there, which I'm curious to get your, your thoughts on. And then right after that, uh, Greg Henriquez, Zach Stein and Jordan Hall had a session. <laughs> it was like, you know, escape velocity meta, like all this like, you know, galaxy brain stuff. And it was good, but it was a totally different vibe. Um, and I do think it's a wrong move to kind of shame that, that, that vibe because that's an onboarding point for a lot of people as well. Um, and so I'm curious uh, what you think about this like an embodiment vibe and maybe how it relates to women and femininity uh, and how it could interface with this kind of more meta uh, disembodied vibe. Well, um, I, I'll ask you something first. I, I, this is something that I've coming personally and having worked in this. Um, I, I feel like I'm a quite a feminine essence person and in order to be able to kind of intellectually, um, to speak in an intellectual way or to speak in this meta level, I have to have, have felt a heart connection and an emotional connection first. And I really struggle in these environments where um, where the pressure is just to kind of present and kind of put your put your ideas out there and kind of and be um, be one of the heroes. Um, and I, I don't I, I need to be embodied in order to in order to um, access it. And I think that's um, something that I've mm -hmm. experienced that I was lacking. Um, and yeah, exactly like this feeling of being embodied that, that I also got from the from the conversation with Nora and Bonisa. Um, it's something that helps people to feel grounded and comfortable mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And also sometimes when I see these like hyper intellectual conversations, for me, it's funny because I get the feeling that the people that talk, they don't seem that disconnected, they don't seem disconnected to me right. yeah. either. Like I, I've seen very intellectual people in real life and online. Well, they, yeah. And they do come across as disconnected, but like, Fortunately, like not the people like Jordan or like Jack uh, Zach Stein. Daniel At Schmack. least I don't. Yeah, or, or Daniel Schmachtenberger. Like I don't know them personally, but the feeling that I have from them is that they are integrated and embodied people. So then, like, how is it that we've created this um, yeah. environment that just brings out this part of themselves? Mm. Um, but then on the other side, on on the embodied conversation, the funny thing about embodied conversation or um, embodied living of this is that sometimes you don't even need the content preach. This is something that I think Joe was here, Joe Edelman from Auto, um, Human Systems, you're here, hi. <laughs> um, and he's a really good friend of mine. And we were, when we hung out, we talk a lot, um, well, or at least at the beginning we did, of how what we do is not talking about game B, but really playing game B. And even though we can go like super intellectual, sometimes that we're hanging out, we're just playing games and we're just being silly and being funny. But all the things that we're doing, like they are just really strongly um, having in themselves all the values that we talk about. It just manifested. And sometimes like the intellectual content of it is zero. And it's not because we can't do it, but it's just because there reaches a point where we don't need to anymore. When you've gone through like all these ideas and like you, you just get it, the appeal and the allure of like all this meta talk, it's just like, yeah, I've, I had to appeal, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah but this is not to say that the content of it it's not rich because it, it's obviously it's, wow right yeah. so uh we'll pivot to the chat i'll just ask one quick question um and i, I do agree that like guys like daniel schmachtenberger zach stein are very embodied but there's something about the broadcast mode that creates a, a certain energy especially when you're not an epistemic peer with someone mm -hmm. um but like so what, what is uh the vibe that you two are bringing uh, and especially with your project that you, you have going on in Berlin that you're, you're going to launch soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is our vibe? What is our vibe? Um, it definitely, it's, it's more playful, young and cheeky and irrever like irreverent. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, that I found was that, um, and I'm just gonna like be now completely like honest in myself here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that we had like so much like wholesome, earnest, like Boy Scout energy. Boy Scout energy. Boy Scout <laughs> energy. And like, we love the Boy Scouts. Like they're, you know, super sweet, like the Hufflepuffs. <laughs> <laughs> but we need more archetypes. Like right, that's what creates like richness of soils. Um, so what is the, you know, like mean girl, like, you know, the 
bad witch, like sexy kind of like bad boy, because there's like a lot of appeal in that, in a way like going Jordan Peterson see, um, <laughs> it's, you know, if you cannot take, if you're like just too good that people cannot be afraid of you, then you cannot, you know, if you, people don't feel like you can stand up for yourself, like you cannot stand up for others. Um, but also, and that's like the sexiness and the appeal that of the bad boy um, archetype, but also, um, there's this element of being like slightly provocative and transgressive that is that's what I was trying to do with the memes I know that some of them like can feel a bit triggering for some people but mm -hmm. for me that is something that I want to play with and like play with the edges and I feel it's very true to the meta modern spirit of having extremely good intentions because I believe that everyone that's here um, mm -hmm. do have really pro-social intentions and we want to create like a radically better world we, you know can we make a utopia on it like yes let's do it but if we're just only coming with this energy it feels sometimes naive or kind of like disconnecting from people who are like not that into it so then you need to add a bit of i say evil spice. for spice <laughs> you know like a bit of like this literary vibes and that's when it creates like much more complexity like this duality comes and it just i feel it's a much more attractive uh product but in the end everyone should just be their authentic self and like have their authentic vibe even though authenticity can well yeah kind of I mean, up, and then and within and within you know within the project there will be their own own mini vibes as well so yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and we have a similar vibe but we're not even like the same vibe no no and yeah i mean i don't know everyone's really stuff but yeah <laughs> um but yeah i mean we could go on I don't oh, know. cool um so let's uh pivot to the chats now uh i have shy vibe right now evan <laughs> shy <you're> vibe. <laughs> yeah so um peter that discussion that you just were having uh kind of prefigured and touched on some of the elements of my question but i'm just going to go ahead and read it and let you take it wherever you want um so <clears throat> my question is a problem with the sense making scene which i have noticed and which you also seem to have gestured at in your presentation is that the major players seem to generally conceive of, or at least to like transmit a sense of sense making as a primarily intellectual activity. You know, there's a heavy focus on epistemology and similar framings. And to me, this seems to elide the deep mutually supporting and interdependent relationship between skillful ways of relating to our embodiment, to our emotional experiences and to our intellectual capacities. So lots of people in the sense making seem seen seem to have their own practices and ways of skillfully relating to these aspects of human experience but they seem to underemphasize the skills of embodiment and for lack of a more precise term a sort of tantrically vibed way of skillfully engaging with one's emotions relative to the importance of those things for good sense making and so i'm curious to hear your thoughts regarding the ways in which the sense making scene could better emphasize the development of the whole human which seems to me to be necessary for truly excellent sense making and choice making Mm. Mm -hmm. Great question. <laughs> I think you're going to go okay. No, or if you have something to say. How can the sense, so the question is, how can the sense making scene better integrate an awareness or integrate a kind of um, awareness of the importance of an emotional uh, and embodied like a way of moment. making sense? Um, well, yeah, by doing exactly that, <laughs> by, by integrating it and, and having these kind of conversations that we're having now. Um, and like you say, they, it, it's spoken about it. It's something that's mentioned, but it's, I mean, how do we, um, how do we create spaces in which people can physically have that experience rather than just speaking about it? And this is something that we tried to do with the Emerge Gatherings was to create these spaces where people could, could kind of have these embodied experiences. But, um, you know, it, it, yeah, it had its... Uh, I yeah, I feel like this is essentially a social design problem um, because we're talking about how how we carry these conversations and how we engage in these conversations. And a conversation, even though um, we're so used to them that we don't see it, has a specific design to it. And the design is that I talk, you listen to me, and yeah. if this is like a conversation then that I'm the one that's talking and there's certain like social norms of what is it accepted to say and like not accepted to say and how you should show up and how you should not show up. And this is like the invisible code of conversations. So I feel like here the crucial, um, like the crucial point that we should be trying to look at in order to like shift these conversations to a more um, full human embodied uh, way of, of being 
um, would be to look at this code and then experiment, like create yeah. conversational games. So in this conversational game, we're going to try to and pin down the values that we want um, to try to experiment in that in, in that like little conversation. So in this conversation, we're going to tr try to talk intellectually, but with vulnerability. And then with a social designer, maybe this is something that we could do in, in the next um, social design club at the STOA, redesigning um, the sense making conversations. But it, it is actually a, a design problem that we need to experiment. We need to like pin down which are the values that we want to create and then see, see which are the methods that work best. Um, and this is probably like not a conversation that we should have, but like a, a doing uh, a design session. Yeah, I love that. And like the key no, is making... for that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that the idea of making it playful too. You know, like uh, that with the focus on these redesigning, uh, these sense making conversations. Um, so if you, if you have any statements too that you'd like to say, and just I uh, will call on you as well. It doesn't have to be a question. Uh, Cheryl, you had a, a thought I think would be good to share. Yeah, I'm happy to share. I love this session. Um, what you were describing about your vibe being very irreverent and playful, I think I just I found it very immediately disarming about, I would say, a scene that I've been curious about and kind of adjacently attending a lot of talks around. But I also haven't been feeling quite the vibe of it, even though I think a lot of the content resonates. And just seeing the two of you show up and kind of like be badass with your memes, I think made it feel frankly a lot more accessible to me. Um, so yeah, I think there is like this real power to being able to, I think use humor especially to disarm. So thanks for that. I just wanted to say we need more of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, that's really great to hear. Uh, probably that would have been me, like, yeah, any of these years back. Yeah. So, deeply feeling. Manuel, you had a, a similar comment. Yes, thank you, ladies. Um, forgive my photo. I'm not video friendly right now. Um, I feel so much resonance with you. Yes, we need more of you, and I am one of you. Um, the High you know, intellect was a part of my onboarding via Jordan Hall, and I, I do appreciate all the deliciousness, you know, solar masculinity and, and big $2 words that are bandied about. I think it's great. My experience in um, this empathy circle technology we've had for the last month has been really interesting because sometimes um, some of these super high intellect guys um, they're just not being heard or they're not connecting and they're they're feeling that absence of like communitas and so I, I'm seeing a bit of like sprouting there of like maybe I need to restructure how I show up so I can actually um, connect with people and not just display my intellect so that's been interesting and then um, as I was able to sort of onboard and, and be messy and sort of express myself and make statements, now I'm finding my empathetic role much more delicious and I really have this capacity to listen and mirror back. And I, it's not as interesting to me to like state my claim, but more to reflect. And, and I see this uh, this change in people as they feel heard, like they're just enter a new space to maybe they're more receptive and maybe they have more uh, of a vision of what it is to embody what they're feeling. So um, in fact, speaking of messy, I feel like the statement might even be a little bit messy, but so far the empathy circles where we really hunker down and mirror each other has been the most fruitful, you know, quote, technology I've seen. But I'm also really inspired by you two and, and to hear you say thank you, daddy, to Peter. Oh my God. All right. All right. All right. Game, game the fuck on, okay? Because I got that shit in spades. I've been, I've been toning it down. I've been toning myself way, 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 way down. Don't need, don't, don't need. Like <laughs> these are the social terms that we were saying is invisible that we need to get rid of. Not for every <laughs> cool ones. <laughs> for the cool kids. Awesome. I love it. So I think, I think that's it. I think I've said enough. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Stoic Daddy was about to mute you there, uh, Manuel, because I think that uh, didn't happen. <laughs> um, so uh, let's do a Christian. Christian, you're up, up next. Okay, I think my first question has been answered pretty well already. Is it okay if I ask my most recent question here? Yeah, whatever, whatever one is alive. Thanks. Um, the question is on ideas about <clears throat> how to harness the energy of social media toward sense-making and uh, embodiment and all of these things we'd like to talk about um, rather than strictly characterizing it as the, you know, the dilemma of social media. How you can tap in and to the energy of people wanting to engage with liking and all the kind of more shallow aspects of social media uh, toward you know something that you believe in beyond just the memes. Does that question come across? You guys are muted, by the way. How how to harness the power of social media in a way that's not shallow. Yeah. Yeah, or, or toward you know whatever you feel like you the change you want to see. Um, <laughs> um, well, this is something that I've personally been thinking of for a long time, and it's challenging, but also I feel it has a very high impact. Um, possibility. The challenging part is that social media is not a neutral space for just like plug in and kind of like fully be yourself, like unhibited. Like social media is any social media, any, any platform that you go has very strong, um, not just normal, but a very strong architecture that's that like kind of directs the conversation and directs your role in it towards a certain place. And these places, at least unfortunately how everything is set up don't tend to be the best places and the places that feel like most narrative that's why i say challenging however it's not impossible and if this if this is done properly it has and it, it has the potential for having enormous impact right now um at least for what i've, I've been yeah uh, thinking of and investigating i feel like memes and influencers are the two are the two things that have been tried on social media that already work um and that could have a lot of potential if done in our own way like the meta modern way and going back to that i feel that also what the best way to play with this is to get something that is already working so um same meme format or if you're doing like influencer like say the same kind of makeup tour or house tour but like make it meta modern because that's how you link something from the previous imaginary that's mm. how you link something that people have already an emotional connection to and people already understand with something new and that's how they consider contrast for me what at least it doesn't necessarily work so well um but this is all of course um, a matter of scale if you just do like explainer videos or if you just do um, like podcasts or interviews, this works well for like a certain audience, but for what, what you need for like broad culture um, change and like for broader scale is a more subtle way of, of doing that content. But it would, this is an area that definitely has a lot of potential and any agency that was exploring that with this like specific lens I think would be very promising. And it's something that, yeah, we're definitely like putting our focus in right now, still trying to figure out. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. I look forward to seeing what you guys figure out. Yeah, probably like ask us again in a year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tyler had a, a really good thought. Um, I was hoping you could share it, Tyler. Uh, it resonates a lot with kind of what I'm doing with the journals as well. Sure. <clears throat> Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, just want to say thanks so much, Tartanelli. Really appreciated this. I was looking forward to it. Um, I guess my comment was that in my brief experience in this space, um, I noticed that these hyper jargony sense maker figureheads um, tend to stray away from 
telling any sort of personal stories or personal histories when they're broadcasting unless they're actually asked by some sort of moderator. Whereas the more accessible types um, and female broadcasters tend to often lead with that as you two did today actually. Um, and I find personally that hearing people's personal stories and their personal history as well as in the moment displays of vulnerability just immediately allows me to connect and have a greater sense of trust um, in the space that we're in. And it's something that I've learned mainly through like the political organizing space where the work that I do around climate justice, the, the strategies we use are really tied to telling stories as a way to connect with folks. Um, and so just kind of probing at how can we create more spaces for the folks on these sorts of calls to be sharing stories as well as the people that we're trying to learn from. So not really a question, but just a, a suggestion idea for us all to consider. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the, I, um, this, the pointing out that we let we let, led with that because yeah, I mean, it just came naturally to, to introduce ourselves. And I think um, um, when, I think the reason why we did that actually was because we felt like we weren't going to be taken seriously. <laughs> so we just thought we have to just show up with all of our cards and say, this is who we are. And, and you know, we don't have the, the kind of cultural capital in the, in the sense making scene that, that other people have. Um, and, and yeah, and uh, like you said, you connected to it. And so that's really, that shows. Yeah. Powerful. Actually, at the beginning, we were a bit resistant of whether to do it or not to do it, because it's true what you said, that most people don't do it. And then it felt, oh, if we go and like talk about our story, we will make it feel like everything is about ourselves. And we're trying to kind of like capitalize on our like young, you know, like woman thing, and it will feel like unauthentic. Um, but then actually like the most authentic thing is to just be yourself and create a different space for you. And like personally, when I read interviews and when I like listen to podcasts, I really want to know the story. Like I want to know the gossip. Like, who are you married to? Like, what, you know, what, what did you do when you were young? Like, and this is not just the way of, I think this is really beautiful because you get to like see the person, not just as what they say, but as a full human being with all their complexity and like all, you know, their quirks and their story behind. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like great for illustrating, but also in like a more strategic way. We are humans that are wired to love gossip, like information and information about people is power and like that was especially true you know back in our hunter gatherer days so even if you're just like talking about stories in a very strategic how to get more people hooked that's just um, a great idea but also it just feels much more comfortable for us it, to yeah be, it helps to just it helps to make yourself yeah comfortable as well. yeah so just be there so yeah thank you yeah and uh, the whole the thing about kind of storytelling too uh like I worry that some of these scenes just kind of instrumentalize storytelling in order to like manipulate, get things. But it's something like um, what I see you're doing and what I try to do in the journals, just kind of like allow yourself to be a little messy and give you permission to fuck up and be human and, and vulnerable and all that stuff. And that a lot of people vibe with that. Yeah, totally. We love your newsletter. Yeah, I love it. Like, <laughs> and it I, makes I you feel like much more human and approachable. Yeah. Instead of like being just this host that has, you know, like, it's creating like this empire of intellectuals on the internet. We get to see you as like your true, like vulnerable, like unhinged self. And that's really beautiful. And someone just put in the chat, love the reclaiming of gossip. So we we are at the hour. Um, do you have any uh, closing thoughts or anything you like to leave us with? Um, I feel great about this it, it, on the way here. I said to Ellie, like, what would, at the end of this call, like, what would you have to feel to feel like this went well? And uh, I feel like it ticks all my boxes. So um, mm. I want it to feel a sense of being embodied throughout the conversation and be able to keep a, um, keep a hold on, on that grounding. Mm -hmm. So I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking the same thing. Like, we're just having this, like, really beautiful walk. Um, across, you know, where we live in Berlin and it was autumn. I was like, wow, how, how this will go? I hope it goes well. And it just, it, yeah, I felt like it really went well. I feel very grateful to have, have been here and been able to open the space. Yeah. Open the space and that our thoughts resonated with all of you and not just like our thoughts, but our vibe. <laughs> yeah. 
um, that's what feels like most comforting. Yeah, more the vibe than the thoughts. Um, yes, yeah. I feel like that's that's like the most. <laughs> the vibe is the, is the rebranding of embodied. Exactly, <laughs> and yeah, I guess um, like shame, shameless self promo. <laughs> if you're curious about like experiments in like meta modern social media and all this stuff. Follow us because we're <laughs> yeah we're launching a new project soon and we're yeah. very excited to bring the conversation in that way so yeah beautiful yeah and just send me any information you want uh, I'll put it on the kind of the description on the YouTube when I throw it up there um, and I'll make some closing announcements in a moment but Taran Ellie thanks so much uh, I I really like was vibing with what you were bringing and I, I imagine a lot of people were here as well um, and hope you can bring more of your vibe to the Stoa and other places in the scene um, so. Yeah, uh, if you want to continue this conversation, you can go to Discord. We have a Discord. Uh, check out more events. Uh, we got a what? A, like a, maybe let's not. We're supposed to. We got a party coming up um, party. soon. Uh, let me let me share my screen actually, so I can properly show it off. Uh, boom. Yes, it is maybe not the end of the world election party. Uh, <laughs> Stoic breath, uh, you know, Joe uh, is going to be there from Human Systems, uh, Collective Presencing, Shame Breakthrough Bootcamp, Existential Dance Party. That's dope if you haven't been to that before. Socratic Speed Dating. So if you have vibe with these playfully pretentious terms, uh, feel free to go November 3rd. Uh, it's all day. Um, so I'm quite excited about that. And uh, yeah, just check out the website. We have Patreon and Substack. Um, so that being said, thank you so much for coming to Stoic, everyone. Thank you. Okay. I want to I want to read